Watch this. Idaho has gotten its share of national attention of late because we're growing so fast, because our housing costs are rising even faster, and because our executive branch is going through some things. But not all attention, national attention, has to be negative. That growth has helped highlight Idaho and its leadership. For example, Canyon County Sheriff Kieran Donahue was recently elected as a vice president on the National Sheriff's Association's Executive Committee. So now Idaho has a seat at the table within one of the largest nonprofit associations of law enforcement professionals in the country. Why is that important? Well, the National Sheriff's Association works very closely with Washington, with lawmakers on issues that local communities face. Sheriff Donahue is now in a position to advocate for Idaho in a way that no other Idaho sheriff has. When things happen in Congress, when, when bills are being heard, uh, when the Supreme Court is, is looking to uh, look at cases, the National Sheriff's Office does a lot of amicus briefs. We are asked constantly to weigh in on those issues before they even get to a congressman, before they get to a senator, uh, before they get to the Supreme Court. I'm now in part of that discussion each and every day. And so, you know, my phone rings or my computer that we've got an email. We need to address this. Someone needs to weigh in on it. Well, I'm willing to weigh in on it and give my perspective, but that's just one perspective. We want all of our organizations input so that we can help guide that discussion and really help guide that, uh, that uh, uh, decision making. As a vice president on the National Sheriff's Association Executive Committee, Donahue will have the unique opportunity to bring Idaho issues and perspectives to the national conversation. He says this is a great development for Idaho, who now has an important seat at the table. The fact that Idaho is now kind of centerpiece, uh, that's pretty significant. Uh, it really has to be underscored that we've never, we've never had a sheriff at this position, at this level. And so when we're talking with Congress, we're talking with uh, uh, the administration, the city administration uh, at the time, then Idaho is well represented, or I hope to be well represented uh, for Idaho out there, and we can bring these issues to hand, and we can help form policy, and we can help form uh, uh, the parameters of things that we need to address that affects all of us. Um, having a key position with such a powerful organization, yeah. what Idaho issues are you hoping to bring to the table and get more traction with? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. That part of that, first and foremost, is is really what we all always come back to in these conversations, and that's the drug, illicit drug trade, the, the cartels of Mexico. It's not the good people of Mexico that we're in a battle with. God bless people wanting to make a better life for themselves, whether you're from Ecuador or Guatemala or, or Yemen or Syria or wherever, right? They're coming here for a reason. We have to set the rhetoric aside, and I think that's part of my job is to help with that and put policy in place so that we can give them that opportunity because what's happening now is they're being victimized by the Mexican cartels in such dramatic fashion. It's indescribable. It's unspeakable, heinous crimes to children, to women especially, where they're placed into work programs far from that border throughout our United States with very criminal-oriented people that are indentured servitude. I mean, that's slavery, quite frankly. And it's the human trafficking side, the sex trafficking side. If we just stop for a moment and get rid of the, the rhetoric and say, yes, we, we have different views, but what we have a common view and a common goal, and that's to address the victimization of those people. And that's, that's really a big goal of mine, is to continue to try to, to drive that point forward. And with this new position and what you're in line to do over the next few years, you feel more empowered now to I do. do something about this? I do feel more empowered. You know, it's just like my work with domestic violence. I feel more empowered because, again, I'm going to be driving that conversation and, and I'm going to be vocal about it. Respectful, professional, but vocal. Let's, we have to get to the root of the problem. All right, Joe, Kieran Donahue put in this position about a week ago. A week ago, now what? Well, he's going to serve as what is called the third vice president for this association. And the way it works is every year they have a new president. 
So in three years, in 2024, Sheriff Donahue is going to be the president of the National Sheriff's Association, which is a very big responsibility, and it really is a hallmark for Idaho law enforcement. As Sheriff Donahue highlighted for us this afternoon, he's the first Idaho sheriff to be in the position he's in now, and he says he's excited to take on the responsibility he has now and really into the future. Yeah, more than just a seat at the table, like one of the head tables. The seat at the table. Exactly. All right, thank you very much, Joe. All right, so you heard Dr. or excuse me, Kieran Donahue, Sheriff Donahue mention the border. What is going on on the border? Idaho is about to get a first hand look with the deployment you can count on one hand. Last month, Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Arizona Governor Doug Ducey sent a letter to the nation's governors asking for extra manpower to help secure the US Mexico border. Two weeks ago, Governor Little said Idaho would take part. And today we have kind of learned what that looks like. Beginning next week, five Idaho State Police troopers will head to the border in Arizona for a 21 day mission. They're going to assist Arizona State Police with intelligence gathering and investigative work related to stopping drugs from coming across the border. Governor Little says they'll act as a force multiplier, but with just five troopers, it might be more like force multiplying by fractions. In a statement, Little says this is happening because of failed immigration policies put in place by President Biden and Vice President Harris. Drug seizure, seizures for meth, fentanyl and heroin have doubled since Biden took office, and we've seen the highest number of illegal crossings this year in 21 years. Governor Little said Biden reversed numerous Trump policies that kept the American people safer, and now our nation's governors must step up to protect Americans because the Biden Harris administration won't. Well, is the US seeing a record breaking number of illegal crossings and at the moment? Yes. These charts are from the US Customs and Border Patrol, and this one shows the areas in the southwest where crossings are happening. And just since last October, more than 897,000 people have been caught trying to cross the border. The year prior, from October 2019 to October 2020, about 229,000 people, which is a 291% increase year over year. A majority of those, about 43%, are coming from Mexico and are single adults. Should this year's trend continue, we could see the highest number of illegal crossings recorded since 2000. So yes, that would be the highest in 21 years. Is this the fault of the Biden administration? Well, that just depends on who you ask. And what about the drugs? Well, looking at last four years or so from US Customs and Border Patrol, the gray line that you're seeing there is 2018. Orange line is 2019. Red line or dark red there is last year. The blue line is what we're on this year. And you can see eh, not much of a change between the last several years. So it doesn't exactly look like it's doubled up to this point. But this is just what law enforcement officers have caught. And there's obviously no data on what hasn't been pulled. Marijuana is number one in this list, followed by meth, cocaine and fentanyl. So what will it cost to send five Idaho State Troopers to Arizona for three weeks? Governor's office says about $53,000. It has been almost two weeks since Idaho discontinued all federal CARES Act unemployment assistance programs. 
That extra $300 a week that was given to those who qualified for unemployment. Well, Governor Brad Little says he made that decision back on May 12th, an effort to motivate Idahoans to get back out into the workforce. The question is, has it worked? Katya Stepovic spent the day checking back in with a few businesses that we have spoken with and profiled here before. Some that just a month ago were so short staffed they had to close down a couple days a week. So how are they doing now? What's your reaction to cutting that extra money in on? Oh, elated. In just two weeks, Eddie Bird, owner of Eddie's Diner, was able to hire eight people, and he thinks the decision to cut the emergency payment of $300 for those receiving unemployment was a good one. I had a few cooks that we offered $15 to $20 an hour, and they didn't take it because they could make that much at home. Saying that he's had to compete with the amount of money that people make in unemployment benefits by increasing hourly wages anywhere from $13 to $20 an hour. But there comes a point when. You know, you have a price point to where you can only charge so much for an omelet or a cheeseburger. So you, you, you just, you know, you get to that price point to where you, you've got to make a decision. But the battle isn't over. The diner still has to close down two days a week and reduce hours on other days because of the staffing shortage. Yeah, we still have about 27 seats that we're not using between tables and booths. And um, the flow is actually better that way. And but we just can't add it because we only have so many servers on the floor and so many cooks back there that were it. It would overwhelm them and then the service is poor for the customer. Not having enough staff also has another downtown restaurant closed two days a week. If you come down here on a Monday to 8th Street in booming Boise, uh, it's tough to even find lunch because so many places are closed. But Casey Montgomery, owner of Juniper, says after being able to hire 12 employees between all three of his restaurants in the last two weeks, he's hopeful that the ghost town feel will be a thing of the past. In the last couple of weeks, we have had more people answering uh, help wanted ads. It's a huge relief um, because, you know, the main thing you want to do is you want to take care of people when they come into the restaurant and you want to uh, have happy employees. And so when you're trying to do seven days with a short staff, it doesn't work. He also thinks upping hourly wages by 20% has a lot to do with increased interest. This definitely has made the in restaurant industry reevaluate. Um, and uh, so, you know, we put, pay 16 to $20 an hour. Um, and I think, you know, honestly, uh, it's been good for everybody. And everything we tried, whether it was bonuses, um, that sort of thing, it never really worked, to be honest with you. Um, so we're taking that money, all allocating it to uh, a higher hourly wage, and, you know, going that route. Not all good things come easy, or quickly for that matter. We're all trying, we're all trying hard, uh, and everyone out there is hurting for workforce and you know everyone's trying to figure it out um, and the expectations um, are still really high so maybe in the meantime you know a little bit of kindness a little bit of patience um, certainly goes a long way it's been a tough year <laughs> but we're going to get through it but yeah i'm ready for this to be all over with Now, since the state of Idaho announced it would be stop issuing that $300 a week, we've actually seen over 800 people completely stop collecting unemployment benefits. So I think people are slowly but surely re-entering the workforce, but we'll truly see the impact of that when the June unemployment rate comes out in the coming weeks. Brian. And Katya, I believe that re-evaluation of wages also has to play a part in this as well. So a lot of things coming together at once here. Thank you very much.
Ain't two peas in a pod or two beans either. They ain't but one Pinto Bennett. Those are the words of Billy Joe Shaver, the legendary outlaw country singer songwriter. Tuesday night, the one and only Pinto Bennett passed away at the age of 73. He'd been dealing with health issues for the better part of two decades, heart attacks, strokes. He even caught COVID-19 last October. Still, his passing was sudden, according to his daughter. Pinto had been an icon in Idaho's music industry for more than one generation. From the time he first dragged his guitar around the world playing what he and many others called hard country. Six years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting Pinto and spent a couple of hours talking to him about his career in country music. In celebration of Pinto Bennett, Gem State raised and the self-described honky-tonk hero of Idaho, we bring you today's 208 Redial. Sounds cool. Garden City may not be considered the center of the Idaho music universe, yeah, but when Pinto yeah, Bennett sits down right. in the studio at the Audio Lab, this is like church to me too. It is. It's a real epiphone, man. <laughs> Pinto, not exactly his given name. Yeah, it was given to me because I had spots. Grew up the freckled son of a sheep farmer in Elmore County. Oh man, when I, I was the ugliest kid you ever seen. And he knew early on where he would end up. All my days are empty and I mean, I knew that when I was nine years old. Yeah, I did, I knew what I was gonna do. Then Elvis, the man, Elvis changed my life. I'm doing right, is sitting here. My first time I got paid to play was at Marv's drive-in in Mountain Home. Just when I think that was in junior high, he made $17. Soon he was making more money as a musician than his family on the farm. Well, well, all right. By the time he joined the band Tarwater in the 70s, he was getting paid a grand a week. If I didn't have so many bad habits, I'd, <laughs> I could have sent my kids to Stanford. <laughs> In the 80s, he formed the famous Motel Cowboys. Sometimes but the fame part only came when a friend called from Europe. He goes, hey man, they're playing your record over here. So they flew overseas and found a steady gig. Yeah. For the better part of two decades. Wherever we went, we were treated like stars. And that, that was good enough for me. But fame in a foreign land didn't exactly translate to the States. Five. And Pinto, the 68-year-old father of four, Seven great grandkids. I have a hard time going down. Has since but settled. Now I'm good. Into semi retirement. I'm rocking. I don't know what to do. He has written almost 400 songs. And we were talking about getting time off for bad behavior. So when he picks up the guitar, he has a long playlist to shuffle through in his head. Pinto Bennett, she wrote. Pinto has survived heart attacks, is blind in his right eye. You handled it bad. Suffers from vertigo and diabetes. But he loses all sight of that when he's in the studio or on the stage. And I think oh, that yeah, I know of course. I still do this stuff, you know. I call it Jed Clampett now. <laughs> she wrote. Every time he picks up a guitar and opens his mouth, it, something brilliant comes out. Oh, hell yeah, man. Steve Fulton, a fan of Pinto since childhood, owns the studio where Pinto produced his last few albums. 50s rock and roll and 60s country, man, that's, that's my groove. It's also the place where Pinto's music will be sung by other artists this weekend in a two-day event because one wasn't enough. We've got you know, 18 artists that are covering this stuff and we were turning people away. It happen. Which goes to show, Every unfamiliar doesn't mean unknown. I'm just glad to be part of it, any scene at all these days. You know? And Idaho's music world will once again revolve around right here. He's a legend really here and his uh, legacy is gonna be, you know, forever. Brian Holmes. Idaho's News Channel 7. Pinto started sharing a lot more with Steve Fulton 17 years ago when he asked him to record his next album, and he did in 2004. From then on, Steve was our guy, which is how Pinto referred to those in his circle. And he recorded every record since at Steve's studio, including his last in 2018 called The Last Saturday Night. Our guy. But Steve was a Pinto guy long before when he saw Pinto's band Tarwater playing the beer garden at the Western Idaho Fair.
He was too young to get in, but something about Pinto's band made him stand there outside the fence and just watch for 45 minutes. That something Steve told us today was Pinto's energy. Well, well, all right. It was one of the things that really influenced me when I saw him. I just thought they were amazing. And I wasn't even in the country music that much, but there were there was something about the the presentation of them that, that I think anybody would love. The main thing that I was always admired about Pinto was he his his way of he treated everybody the, exactly the same way, like they were all friends. And Steve was one of Pinto's friends. He phoned frequently. He would call me and he and he would be almost like he was t in the room with me. He wouldn't be like he's on the phone trying to hurry. It's like he's taking his time and he's like, Steve, it's your old pal Pinto. I got some big ideas. And he would say things like this on the phone to me and, and leave a message. And then there'd be a big long pause. Well, I guess, I guess you'll have to call me back. I've never met anybody that had more fun, funny quips than him, you know, stuff that I, I've written down, things that he said. Those quips would often make it into his music. Music, I think, probably speaks to people as strongly as any, anything. And so his, his music really speaks to people as well as it did me, you know, and does. Probably because it came from the heart, Steve says. Pinto's songs highlighted his own highs and lows. He struggled with, with alcohol uh, all of his life, and uh, I experienced the good and the bad of it. You know, the good of it is that, you know, it, his big personality comes out even more in the beginning of a couple of drinks, and then it, if he goes too deep, you know, I've, I've had to kind of be there with him when he did a couple of times. But um, you say he's honest. If you want to describe Pinto's music, I would say that is the biggest thing I would take away from his music is it's all so honest. It's just really what he's really experienced. And it's all just super honest. Like Steve's answer about what he will miss most about Pinto. Oh, jeez. I don't know. Just, just his power and the way he brings people together. Because we'll probably all honor him, but he won't be there, you know, so. Which is going to be weird. It's going to be hard. Steve says Pinto was always a larger than life guy and he just outgrew it. They plan to have a tribute to Pinto soon, but they're still working out the details.
All right, final minute of the show here on this Thursday. Several of you offering your opinions on what's going on with Kieran, Sheriff Kieran Donahue, plus what is going on at our border. That was a really good interview with Sheriff Donahue. It's refreshing to hear a very reasoned approach to some of the problems we face, says Bill. Meanwhile, legalized marijuana and over half of the border drug issue disappears, says Larry, which frees up those resources to focus on the more dangerous drugs that are coming across the border. Not sure what I think about our tax dollars being spent to support a right wing propaganda stunt by little in support of a campaign Trumpian agenda. That's what Elizabeth has to say. Meanwhile, then Bob, good for the governor, sending ISP to assist in securing our border. Hope other states will follow his lead. How about a GoFundMe page to finish the wall, says Bob. Well, I think they tried that before, and I think Steve Bannon was involved in that before, right? That didn't turn out so well, this kind of ground sourcing of funds to finish our country's border wall. All right, we're going to do it all again tomorrow. Hope you join us. We'll see you back here then. Have a good rest of your Thursday.